So moving on to chapter 11, where you get to talk about physical and chemical agents for microbial control. So fun stuff. This is, excuse me, I have hiccups. The more application-based. So how do we control microorganisms? Well, the physical, chemical, and mechanical methods to destroy or reduce under microbes in any given area is called decontamination. The primary targets are microorganisms that are capable of causing infections or spoilage, including but not limited to vegetative bacterial cells and endospores, fungal hyphae and spores, yeast, protozoan trophocytes, cysts, worms, viruses, prions, etc. So there are a couple different terms that we need to get uh, familiar with when we talk about these, and this would be sterilization. And sterilizing is the process that destroys all viable microbes, including viruses and endospores. We have disinfection, and this is the process that we use to destroy vegetative pathogens, not endospores, and this is done to inanimate objects, counter surfaces, right? Uh, antiseptic, this would be using disinfectants that are applied directly to the exposed body surfaces. We have sanitation, and this is any cleansing technique that mechanically removes the microbes. And we have degermination, and this reduces the number of microbes through uh, mechanical means. This is a fun little summary table that in your book is figure 11.2. And this is the overview of different uh, physical agents that we can use, chemical agents, and then mechanical um, agents that are not dipped. Okay, and then your, de your um, definitions that we just talked about. Okay, so this is a great little summary table. So when we talk about the relative resistance of microbes, well, we have the highest resistant microbes that are prions as well as the bacterial endospores. They're the ones that have that protective layer or capsule around them, right? We have ones that have moderate resistance, and this would be like your Pseudomonas, your TB, your Staph aureus, as well as some protozoan cysts. And then we have ones that are pretty easy to kill, and these would be the ones that have the least amount of resistance, and this would be bacterial uh, vegetative cells, uh, fungal spores and hyphae, yeast, um, the enveloped viruses, as well as um, protozoan tropozoites. Okay. When we talk about microbial death, this is hard to detect because microbes often reveal no conspicuous vital signs to begin with. Remember, I've told you from the very, very beginning that they're kind of sneaky, right? Um, we are looking for a permanent loss of reproductive capability, even under growth conditions. And that's when we can determine that they are dead. So the factors that can affect this death rate could be the number of microbes that are there. If we have millions, that they're going to be harder to kill off versus just a couple. They're probably pretty easy to kill off. The nature of the microbes in the population, the temperature and pH of the environment, the concentration or the dosage of the agent, and the mode of action of the agent, as well as the presence of solvents, organic matter, or other inhibitors. Um, this here is a fun little table that is in your book. This is figure 11.3, and this is titled Factors That Influence the Rate at Which Microbes Are Killed by Antimicrobial Agents. So in A, in the upper left-hand corner over here, we have the length of exposure to the agent. During the exposure to a chemical or physical agent, all cells in the microbial population, even a pure culture, do not die simultaneously. They don't die at the same time. So over time, the number of viable organisms remaining in the rhythmically giving a straight line relationship on the graph as, a graph, as you can see. The point at which the number of survivors is infinitesimally small is considered sterilization. So that would be down here, okay? In B, over here, you have the effect of microbial load. So if we have a high load, it's gonna be, uh, take longer to sterilize, where if we have a lower load, it's gonna be able to be sterilized a little bit easier. In C, over here, we have the relative resistance of spores versus vegetative um, cells. So the spores last longer than the vegetative cells, which we covered already. And then over here in D, this is the action of the agent, whether it is microbicidial or microbistat microbial static, okay? So the agent is added. If we have microbistatic, these cells are still capable of growing if the agent is removed. And then we have the death of the microbial um, agent. So looking at practical concerns in microbial control. Well, basically, let's see if I can move them over here. Okay. The selection method of control depends on a lot of different things. One is, does the application require sterilization? Is the item going to be reused? Can that item withstand heat, pressure, radiation, or chemicals? Is the method suitable? 
will the agent penetrate the necessary to the necessary extent and is the method cost and labor efficient and is it safe okay so all these things are very important to take into consideration so when we look at that antimicrobial agent's mode of action the cellular targets of the physical and chemical agents include the cell wall or the cell membrane when we target the cell wall, what's going to happen is that cell wall becomes very fragile and the cell lyses or explodes, right? To lyse means to like digest, explode. Um, some antimicrobial drugs, detergents, and alcohol work this way. We also have ones that target the cell membrane, and this is where they lose integrity and some of the effectiveness or the, some of the agents that we use these for these are called surfactants, and this would be like your soap bubbles, et cetera. So when we're looking at this, this is figure 11.5, and this is the mode of action of surfactants on the cell membrane. So right here, you can see that the surfactants are inserting themselves into the lipid bilayer to disrupt it and create an abnormal channel that alter the permeability, and it causes leakage both into and out of the cell. So it's basically going to um, crack that surface tension, right, in that cell wall, and it's going to make the cell kind of explode. Um, looking at antimicrobial agents, modes of actions continued, uh, we can also look at protein and nucleic acid synthesis. Well, this would be like the prevention of replication, uh, transcription, translation, so making RNA copies, protein copies, etc. Peptide bond formation, so destroying that primary structure of the amino acid. Protein synthesis, so we're stopping the making of the protein. Uh, Chloroamphicol, uh, UV radiation, or formaldehyde. So these are agents that are going to be targeting that protein and nucleic acid synthesis. We also have ones that target proteins. And so these um, antimicrobial agents would disrupt or denature the proteins. And these include alcohols, phenols, acids, and heat. So looking at this, this is figure 11.6 in your book. And this is called modes of actions affecting protein function. So in A, which is up here, the native state or functional state of the protein is maintained by bonds that create the active sites to fit the substrate. Some agents denature the protein by breaking all or some of the secondary or tertiary bonds. The results are either B, we have complete unfolding or denaturization. Folding is like de unfolding is called denaturization. We can have C, which is where the random bonding and incorrect folding occurs. So we're going to have a different shape. Or we can have D, where some agents react with the functional groups on the active site and therefore interfere with the um, bonding. The end product for all of these are going to be that the active site can no longer accept the substrate and therefore the enzyme itself is inactive and can't do its job. Looking specifically at methods of physical control, we can use heat, uh, cold temperature, desiccation, or drying out, radiation, or filtration. So when we're looking at heat, it's going to be talking about like different types of heat. We can either use moist heat or dry heat. Okay, autoclave would be one of those that uses uh, steam, right, a steam heat. So um, looking specifically at this, the um, moist heat is lower temperatures in a shorter amount of time and this causes a coagulation and denaturization of the proteins, where dry heat is going to be um, moderate to higher temperature, and it's going to cause the cells to dehydrate or to lose like the water within the cell, and that is going to be altering that protein structure. And one example of this would be incineration or using a fire <clears throat> to just... Um, you know, burn, burn what you have, right? So um, overall, the end product is the death of the cells. It's just a matter of temperature, time, and whether or not there's steam available. So comparing these different um, things, this would be table 11.3 in your book. You can see that the time here is a lot shorter using the moist heat. Um, and the temperatures are overall smaller than using just a dry heat, which would be like your fire, right? And if we have the same temperature of 121 degrees Celsius with moist heat, it only takes 15 minutes, where using a dry heat is going to take 600 minutes. So it's a lot longer. When only, only when we get super duper hot with the dry heat does it get into shorter times, but still moist heat is more effective. Um, looking at thermal death measurements, this would be the bacterial endospores that are most resistant, and usually these require temperatures above the boiling point. So the thermal death time, otherwise known as TDT, 
is the shortest, le shortest length of time that is required to kill all test microbes at a specified temperature, where the thermal death point, which is um, abbreviated TDP, is the lowest temperature required to kill all microbes in a sample within 10 minutes. So looking at these moist heat methods, this is figure 11.7. This is um, using steam under pressure, and this is a form of sterilization. So an autoclave, you guys are all probably very familiar with it. We have one in the microbiology lab too, right? So the autoclave clave, for instance, is going to use 15 PSIs at 121 degrees Celsius for the time duration of about 10 to 40 minutes. And so what happens is the steam must reach the surface of the item being sterilized. And the item must not be heat or moisture sensitive because it would either melt or melt from moisture, right? And the mode of action would again be focusing on the denaturing of those proteins, the destruction of the membranes, as well as destructing um, DNA. So you can see this is an overall picture of how an autoclave would work. When we can use non-pressurized um, steam, one example of that would be uh, tinozolization. Um, and this is intermediate, ster intermediate intermittent sterilization for substances that cannot withstand autoclaving. So what happens is that items are going to be exposed to free-flowing steam for a time duration of 30 to 60 minutes, and then they're going to be incubated for 23 to, 40, 23 to 24 hours, and then they're going to be reintroduced to steam. You're going to repeat this cycle for three days, so that's a long time, but... This is going to be useful when we are doing some things like canned foods as well as laboratory media, because laboratory media, a lot of times it has things that can be heat sensitive, right? And so we're going to need to take kind of drastic measures to get them sterilized. And this is also uh, use, used in disinfecting. Boiling water, simple way of sterilizing. So they say like, you know, sterilize your baby bottles, uh, canning lids, I'm a home canner, right? And so these are things that we use. And so basically what we do is you can boil water at 100 degrees Celsius, so that's your boiling point, for 30 minutes to destroy non-spore forming pathogens. And this is also a mode of disinfection. Then you can talk about pasteurization, and this is table 11.4, uh, and um, there's a little picture there of a flash pasteurization tool, which is here. And so pasteurization, think of milk, right? So heat is applied to kill potential agents of infection and spoilage without destroying the food flavor or value. So for instance, for a bath batch method using a large batch, we would use 63 to 66 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, where you, or you can use a flash method, which is gonna be a higher temperature for a shorter amount of time. So 31.6 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. And basically this isn't sterilization, but it is going to form or kill those non spore forming pathogens and therefore lower overall microbial count. Again, this is not going to kill endospores or many non-pathogenic microbes, but it's going to kill like the food spoiling um, pathogen or bacteria, etc. So like I said, pasteurization, it's start, it used to be illegal to sell unpasteurized milk, but sometimes you can buy it from farms, etc. And therefore, it's not going to have any um, bacteria killed off. What about dry heat? Well, dry heat is using higher temperatures than the moist heat. And this would be like your incinerization, incineration. Apparently I'm making up words today, that's fine. So this is where you're gonna use a flame or an electrical heating coil. This is going to ignite and reduce the microbes and other substances. And this would be like your dry ovens that are gonna run at about 150 to 180 degrees Celsius. And we use these to coagulate proteins. Um, we can also freeze things. So this would be microbiostatic, and this is going to slow the growth of microbes. Think of when we put things in the refrigerator or the freezer. They're shelf-stable. I guess it wouldn't be shelf-stable. They're stable for longer, right? So if I leave a thing of tuna fish on the counter for two hours, we're not going to want to eat it but we can leave it in the refrigerator for a couple days, right? And so what this is going to do is it's going to slow the growth of the bad microbes so it takes longer for them to spoil. And so, um, you know, refrigeration is zero to 15 degrees Celsius and freezing is below zero degrees Celsius.
Okay. And again, these are used to preserve food, media, and cultures. What about desiccation? Okay. Um, this is basically the gradual removal of water from cells, and it's going to lead to the inhibition, inhibition of metabolic actions. So this is not effective for microbial control, but many cells do retain the ability to grow when water is reintroduced. So this is called lyophilization. okay? And this is like freeze drying or preservation. So if you've ever had like freeze dried mangoes, freeze dried apples, yeast is another one of these, right? We freeze dry it and then when we put it in water again to reconstitute it, then it can grow again. So using the lyophilization or the desiccation is going to pull the, the water molecules out so that we can actually um, preserve them for longer. What about using radiation for sterilization? Well, ionizing radiation is deep penetrating power that has sufficient energy to cause electrons to leave their orbit, therefore breaking the DNA. There are a couple different types. Um, one is called gamma rays, the other one's x-rays, and the other one's cathode rays. And these are used to sterilize medical supplies and food products. So this here is figure 11.8, and this is the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is where the waves range from the shortest gamma rays to the longest radio waves. Gamma, think about um, kind of like how hurtful they can be, okay? So if you think about radio waves, dude, I listen to the radio 24-7, okay? So these are not harmful at all because they're the bigger ones, the, uh, the bigger waves, right? But then when we go to the shorter ones, the wavelengths down here, these are going to be the harmful ones. So we don't want to like sit in an x-ray machine 24-7 or under UV lights. We don't be crispy, but we'd also have a lot of higher president prevalence of cancer, etc. okay? Um, so the inset shows the spectrum of visible light between UV and infrared. Only ionizing radiation, UV and infrared have implications in microbial control, okay? So obviously you can't just shine a regular red light on something and have it be sterilized. But if we're using infrared beyond the red visible spectrum, then that could potentially be used for sterilization. So when do we use this? Well, this would be an, an application in preserving food with ionizing radiation. So this is figure 11.10. And so many foods can be effectively sterilized by utilizing the penetrating power of ionizing radiation. The radiora uh, symbol, which is this guy over here, um, is applied to fresh food. And this signifies that the food has been irradiated and it is required to be displayed on all food that is treated this way. So at least they mark it so that we can make our own choice. Okay. Um, computer, wake up. There we go. All right. What about um, radiation? Well, we can also use non-ionizing radiation, and this is uh, it has little penetrating power, um, so it must be directly exposed. So this would be like UV light creates pyrimidine dimers, which can interfere with replication. Okay, so um, this would be Figure eleven point eleven, and over here, what this is showing is that. When two adjacent binding bases on one strand of DNA are induced by UV rays to bond laterally with each other, the result is a binding dimer, which is shown in greater detail. So that's this little thing down here. And dimers can also occur between adjacent uh, cystones and thymine and cytosine bases. If they are not repaired, dimers can prevent that damaged uh, segment of DNA from being correctly replicated or copied or transcribes, and high level levels of diamerization dia are lethal to cells, okay? So this is what can happen when we do a stuff, okay? This right here is figure 11.9, and this is showing you specifically right there um, on a larger scale, the cellular effects of radiation. So um, the ionizing radiation can penetrate a solid barrier, such as, and it can bombard a cell, enter it, and dislodge the electrons from the molecules, therefore breaking the DNA, creating massive mutations. Where B, which is the one that's shown here, non-ionizing radiation can enter a cell, strike the molecules, and excites them. And then the effect of the DNA is that it's mutated by forma formation of those abnormal bonds, like the thymine dimers. So, great, but what about using it? Well, this is how we can apply and use non-ionizing radiation. This figure here is 11.12, and this is a UV treatment system for disinf disinfection of water. So water is directed through channels at a water treatment plant, past racks of UV lights, which are these green 
uh, glowing lights. And this system has a capacity of several million gallons per day and can be used as an alternative to chlorinization. And home systems that fit under the sink are also available. So we can sterilize our water and make it cleaner to drink. All right, so specifically talking about filtration then, this is um, a figure 11.13. And so basically what a physical filter is, is it's going to be a physical removal of microbes by passing a gas or a liquid through a filter. And this can be used to sterilize uh, heat sensitive liquids and air in the hospital isolation rooms and in, and in industrial cleaning rooms. Okay, and so basically what here happens here is that this vacuum assembly, and I used to do this in my lab to sterilize my media, it was kind of fun. The vacuum assembly for achieving the filtration of liquids through suction. The inset shows the filter is seen in cross section with tiny um, passageways or pores that are too small for the bacteria to get through. So those tiny little holes. Okay, so um, basically what you're going to do is you're going to pump and suck this liquid through and all the microbes are going to get stuck on the filter paper and then the sterilized media or fluid is going to be um, pushed through and the, therefore there are no microbes in there because it couldn't pass through the filtration. Um, what about using chemical agents in microbial control? This would be like using disinfectants, antiseptics, sterilants, uh, degermers, and preservatives. And some desirable qualities of chemicals include rapid action and low concentration. So we don't want to like have to take a, a bath in a swimming pool to sterilize things. And we want it to work quick. Um, solubility in water or alcohol, have it be stable. Um, have it be broad spectrum so it can affect a lot of microbes. Low toxicity so it doesn't kill us. That it can penetrate and therefore be useful. Um, that it can be non-corrosive and non-staining, and also that it is affordable and readily available. So looking at levels of chemical decontamination, we have high level uh, germicides, and these would kill endospores, and these may be sterilants. And devices that are not heat sterilizable, and they are intended to be used in sterile environments such as body tissues, can undergo this type of sterilization or decontamination. We have an intermediate level, and these are ones that are going to kill fungal spores, not endospores, um, such as tubercles, bacillus, and viruses. And this is used to disinfect viruses, devices that will come in contact with mucous membranes, but they are not invasive. Then we have low level, and these eliminate only vegetative uh, bacteria, such as vegetative fungal cells and some, bac uh, some viruses. And basically, these are cleaning touch surfaces, but not mucous membranes. So what are some different factors that can affect germicidal activity of these chemicals? Well, the nature of the material being treated, the degree of contamination, the type of exposure, and also the strength and chemical action of the germicide. We have a couple different categories um, of germicidal categories, and these would be like halogen, phenolytics, uh, chlorhexidine, alcohols, hydrogen peroxides, aldehydes, glass, gases, detergents, and soaps heavy metals, um, dyes, and acids and alkalines, so acids and bases. So looking specifically at our halogens, well, we can look specifically at chlorine. And so this would be like, there's a nice summary table on a figure 11.7. So chlorine is uh, going to be abbreviated CL2, and these are hypo chlorides such as chlorine bleach or chloramides. And how these work is that they denature the proteins by disrupting those disulfide sulfur-sulfur um, bonds between cysteine amino acids. This is an intermediate level of a disinfectant. It is unstable in sunlight and it is inactivated by organic matter. We can use this in water, sewage treatment, wastewater treatment, and on inanimate objects like our surface. Right now we're in the middle of um, COVID when I'm taping this, right? And so we are using a lot of chlorine bleach for sterilization. Um, we also have iodine or idophores. And an example of this would be like betadine. So these interfere with disulfide bonds of the proteins. This is an intermediate level disinfectant. And this is mild, uh, this is used for milder medical and dental uh, de-germing agents, disinfectants, as well as ointments. What about phenolytics or phenol phenolics? Okay, these are gonna disrupt the cell walls and the membranes as well as uh, precipitate or um, weed out like proteins. 
So these are low to intermediate level of efficacy, um, and these are not efficacy, but strength, right? And these would be targeting bactericidal, fungicidal, virucidal, but not sporocidal. So it can take care of bacteria, fungus, and viruses, but not spores. A good example of this would be like Lysol or Triclosan, which is an antibacterial additive that we can add to soaps. What about chlorhexidine? This is a surface and uh, or surfactant, okay, so it's going to break the surface tension, and a protein denaturant with broad microbial properties. And this is a low to intermediate level, um, and this is um, like can be a hypoclens or hypotain, and these can be used as skin de-germing agents for preoperative scrubs, for skin cleaning, as well as for burns. We also have ethanol, and this would be like using isopropyl ethanol in um, solutions of 50 to 95 percent. And these are going to act again as surfactants, and they're going to dissolve those membrane lipid, lipids and coagulate or stick together proteins of vegetative bacterial cells and fungi. And again, this is an intermediate level disinfectant. What about hydrogen peroxide? Well, these produce highly reactive hydroxyl free radicals that damage protein and DNA while also decompose, decomposing to oxygen gas. And this, um, tox this oxygen gas is toxic to anaerobes. So remember, ana means without, or aerobic would be oxygen. So these would be toxic to our anaerobic bacteria. And they can be used at, as antiseptics in low concentrations, and strong solutions can also be sporicidal. What about aldehydes? Well, these kill by alkylating proteins and DNA, okay? And so basically, glutaraldehyde can be used in a 2% solution, and this can be called Cydex. And this is used for a sterilant for heat-sensitive instruments, and this is a high-level um, agent. What about formaldehyde? Well, this, as well as a disinfectant, a preservative, and the toxicity of it when it's used. Suggestion, they use it in embalming people. So don't play with this because it can be very bad for you. Um, and we can also talk about formalin, which is in the same family as formaldehyde, and this is, you can use this in a 37% aqueous solution, and this is an intermediate to high level. And so basically, this um, is telling you how the glutaraldehyde can be cross-linked with microbial protein, and um, therefore uh, integrate and used as a sterile. So what about gases and um, <clears throat> aerosols? So this here is figure 11.16, and this is using a sterilization um, using ethylene oxide as a sterilizer. So the machine is equipped with gas canisters to contain ethylene oxide, or ETO, and carbon dioxide, and it's a chamber to hold items and mechanisms, and, and it's able to evacuate uh, gas and introduce air. So ethylene oxide uh, and propylene oxide, these are strong alkylating agents. They are high level, and they can be used to sterilize and disinfect plastics as well as um, worked on prepackaged devices and foods. So I actually used gas sterilization techniques when I was doing shunts. And so I was working on a model of congenital hydrocephalus and I would reuse my little um, neonate shunts. And so I had to gas sterilize them so they didn't melt when they were in the autoclave. So I have used this before. Um, what about detergents and soaps? Well, basically, um, quaternary ammonia compounds, also called quats, act as uh, surfactants that are going to alter the membrane permeability of some bacteria and fungi. And these, again, are going to be very low level. Okay, so this would be summarized in table 11.11. 11. Okay, there's a couple different um, pictures in there, and it shows you um, the names of them, etc. So looking at detergents versus soaps. Well, soaps are mechanically used to remove soil and grease containing microbes. If I'm playing with my horse and I have uh, dirt all over my hands, I'm going to scrub, right? And we're going to um, mechanically help to remove those as well. Um, and this is figure 11.17. Okay, so this graph shows some effects of hand scrubbing. So comparison of scrubbing over several days in a non-germicidal soap versus a germicidal soap. Germicidal soaps have a persistent effect on skin over time, reducing and keeping the microbial count low. 
sulf alone does not increase a sustained reduction in the microbial count. It can actually raise it, where this effect is presumably due to the uncovering of skin layers with higher levels of normal residence. Okay, so basically, germicidals work long-term. Non-germicidals, the thought or theory is that it's going to remove some surface um, oil uh, covering, and then it can actually expose microbes that are underneath in the little grooves in your fingers, and then over time it can die down again. Um, what about heavy metals? Well, this is figure 11.18, and um, solutions of silver and mercury can kill vegetative cells in low concentrations by inactivating proteins. And the oligodynamic uh, actions, it has low, it's a low level um, agent, and that you can use silver nitrate or silver. So basically, this picture is 11.18, and if we have a pore plate that is inoculated with uh, saliva and it has small frag fragments of heavy metals that are pressed lightly into it, during the incubation, clear zones indicate quote, growth inhibition, which you can see there, and, and this is developed around both fragments. The slightly larger zones surrounding the um, uh, amalgam, which is used in tooth building, fillings, is probably going to be reflecting the combined effect of the silver and mercury that it contains. Okay. Um, what about dyes as um, antimicrobial agents? Well, aniline dyes are very active against gram-positive species and bacteria of various fungi. And sometimes these are used for antiseptics and wound treatment. These are low level with a very narrow spectrum of activity. And final slide is using our acids and alkalis, or acids and bases. These are organic acids that can prevent spore germination and bacterial and fungal growth as well as um, propionic acid that can retard the uh, mold's growth. Uh, lactic acid prevents the, anti, or the anaerobic bacterial growth, and benzoic and sorbic acid can inhibit yeast. All right, we'll see you guys in class. Thanks.